Welcome everybody to the March 10th meeting of the IMAG MSM Working Group on Multiscale Modeling and Viral Pandemics. I appreciate you coming. Uh, we have a single speaker today and I hope uh, everyone will give them lots of good questions. I have to remind you that this meeting is always, as always live streamed on YouTube and that it is recorded and archived and made publicly available. As always, Reinhardt and I are happy to hear from you with suggestions, comments, criticisms, ideas. Uh, Jim Sluka is available, especially if you want to put things up on the website uh, or suggest speakers. Lorenzo has been doing a great job of helping uh, with organization as the most of the organizing group. You've seen the list of uh, communication channels a million times. Please do help us get the word out about the meetings, about our wonderful archive of talks, and about the IMAG wiki page. Please try to remember to use our Twitter feed, MSM Viral. Help us build this community. I should say that uh, the paper that uh, Jacob, Barak, and company have uh, put so much heart and soul into uh, the members of the working group uh, appeared this past week. Uh, and so I strongly recommend people looking at that. It's the Frontiers uh, Journal, Frontiers in System Biology. And it's uh, got, as you recognize, uh, some names that people know from other contexts and many names that people will recognize as regulars in the working group. I want to thank everybody who participated in that great uh, paper and uh, uh, to celebrate, uh, even for the people who aren't here today, uh, celebrate the achievement in getting that paper out. I know coordinating the uh, many, many contributors and integrating that material is quite challenging. And I think it's a great contribution to the field. Are there any other announcements uh, before we continue? We have a meeting tomorrow of the Digital Twins subgroup. Uh, if you think you should be invited and you haven't been, please let Reinhardt or I know about that. Are there any other announcements today? You can always break in and add them even if I move on. Okay, next week we have two talks organized from Solly Sieberts and uh, Julia Arciero. Uh, March 24th, we have Susan Schreiner. Uh, April 7th, uh, Yu Fan Deng. So we still have openings uh, for March 24th. Uh, we need uh, suggestions for somebody who can fill in March 31st. Unless that's too close to April Fool's Day, and therefore we shouldn't have a meeting on that day. Uh, I encourage people to suggest speakers. Again, as always, feel free to suggest yourself. Feel free to suggest we should have somebody back who's already spoken. Put your graduate students and postdocs forward. This is a forum for all sorts of exploration and opportunity. And so I really do encourage you to help us fill up the calendar. Lorenzo, do you have any comments you want to make about the calendar schedule? Mm, no, nothing particular, but uh, besides stressing once more the propose uh, yourself <laughs> for uh, the empty slots, for in particular March 31st has been a little bit difficult to fill, but, uh, and then if you have a suggestion, I'm always welcome to forward the invitation to, to other people. Yeah. Okay. Well, as always, please try to remember to mute. I know my microphone sometimes causes feedback, so you can remind me to mute myself too. Uh, and then I won't take any more time. Uh, we will move to our single talk of the day, a short talk and followed by discussion on from your nose to your toes, SARS-CoV-2 mediated systemic inflammation in the absence of viremia. Perfect, all right. Um, so with that, um, yeah, I was given double time because I was told there was only one speaker today. 
Um, but yes, if this gets long or too molecular or whatever, please just cut me off. Uh, but my name is Ben Tenuber. I'm a professor of microbiology. Um, I was at Sinai for 13 years in the Department of Microbiology there. Uh, but recently, this past summer, I moved just down the road to NYU to build my own virology institute. Um, but since the pandemic, I've been studying SARS-CoV-2 exclusively, which is what we'll be talking about today. Uh, and as I mentioned kind of in the intro here, I did try to be a little cognizant of areas that I think might be interesting to try and tackle using mathematical modeling, but I may have gotten it totally wrong, in which case I apologize, but um, I will try and make it an interesting talk regardless of whether or not it applies to modeling or not. Um, so I thought I would actually start off with my overall hypothesis just to help frame what I'm going to try and convince you is happening during COVID and what I think is worth modeling. Um, and then I'm going to show you all the data that backs up a model like this. But um, long story short, can you see my pointer? Yeah. Um, so long story short is, uh, you know, you, you breathe in this virus. The virus finds ACE2 expressing cells in the lung, um, initiates an infection there. And uh, we'll go into this in a little bit. But essentially, the response that starts here is really the beginning of what's going to drive the course of the disease. And what I've drawn here really is this is where your airway oxygen uh, carbon dioxide interface is happening. And these little blue dots I've drawn here are just meant to represent various pro-inflammatory cytokines, chemokines, and maybe the interferons, which of course are secreted proteins that are involved in antiviral immunity. And all of these things are going to come out of the infected cell. And the idea is that they end up not just in the airways, but also end up in the circulation. And once in the circulation, they have the ability to dissipate to all the other organs of the body, as does maybe the virus. Um, and we're going to discuss whether or not these two dynamics actually talk to each other or not. And my argument is that they most definitely do. All right, so this is the virus we're going to talk about today. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we've certainly heard plenty about SARS-CoV-2. Um, the only major point I wanted to make here is that maybe for those of you who are um, less aware, the virus comes in, it's a, it's a very large RNA virus as far as RNA viruses are concerned. So about three times the size of most RNA viruses, um, single stranded. It will come in as mRNA, it will make ORF1A first, which is actually a polyprotein, which gets cut up into many pieces that essentially comprise the RNA dependent RNA polymerase. And sometimes they'll have a ribosomal shifting event that will drive the translation of ORF1B, which is also a polyprotein, which will also get cut. But the virus needs a lot less of the ORF1B components, which is why it does this little trick. And the ORF1A, ORF1B is really the replicase of the virus. And later on, we're gonna see this, these subgenomic RNAs come off the end here, and they're really being like nuts and bolts of the structural proteins and the biology of the virus are dictated largely by these guys over here. And what's interesting about that and the reason why it's pertinent not so much to this talk is that this virus, as far as viruses go, is actually quite a sloppy virus. It makes, it makes quite a mess. Um, the mess that it makes is quite inflammatory and um, it's a little unusual for RNA viruses to do this. Usually RNA viruses are, um, spend a lot of their energy and evolutionary selection uh, moving away from the production of aberrant or inflammatory RNA. Um, and the, the SARS-CoV-2 viruses really don't seem to care. Uh, and I say that because this whole back half of the virus, you could imagine this virus could have evolved to have, like many other positive stranded RNA viruses, various open reading frames that just run the length of the genome. But what this virus has evolved to do is these two come in and make the replicate, but all of the other material, it first has to undergo essentially replication. So the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase made by these two polyproteins has to make the antigenome going this way. And then at certain elements called transcriptionally regulatory sequences, it actually lets go of the template and slides all the way down to the genome or alternatively jumps to the other side to another TRS element. Uh, and it does that because the anti-genome that it's going to make now has to have the exact three prime end and the exact five prime end of the genome itself. And that's because RNA-dependent RNA polymerase is an enzyme that has to be able to recognize its own RNA and distinguish its RNA from host RNA. And so it has to do this trick. Um, but as you can imagine, making all these different subgenomic RNAs for all the genes that can encode here does force the polymerase to do a lot of this movement, whether it's jumping or sliding. And that as you can imagine, in all things in biology, nothing is clean or binary, and so this generates a lot of aberrant product. And you can see this um, really easily by, in this case, immunohistochemistry. 
Um, and so what you're looking at here is um, a really uh, interesting antibody called the J2A antibody. It's been around for about 50 years. Um, and this antibody recognizes double-stranded RNA in a non-sequence specific manner. So it just recognizes the weird helical structure that double-stranded RNA makes. And I was saying, when you use this kind of antibody on any RNA virus, you will generally get no signal at all. Um, in general, actually, as ironic as it sounds, the big double-stranded RNA producing viruses are more like adeno and pox viruses, the big DNA viruses. But in the case of SARS-CoV-2, when you use this antibody, you can see that all the infected cells shine nice and brightly green. And this is a byproduct of their very biology, meaning that my only point I'm trying to make here is that once replication starts, it's going to make a lot of inflammatory material that would normally induce a very robust antiviral response. Okay, and so another way to look at this, maybe a little bit fancier, this is single cell sequencing of just cells in culture. These are human lung alveolar cells, A549s. Um, and this is done at a really low MOI. We do single cell sequencing. And this is just to give you a sense of like what the virus is doing to the cell versus what's happening elsewhere. And so in this particular analysis, the orange guys are defined as the infected cells. So what you're looking at here are individual reads captured, mapped back to all of the different genes that the virus makes. And so you can see here in red, obviously they were captured here. And because we captured all these genes and these sequences, we call these cells infected. And then over here, we call these cells the bystander cells that are not quite infected, or at least haven't generated enough um, replication to capture significant reads by the single cell sequencing. And so what's cool about this is that it allows you to then say, well, what's happening in the infected cells versus in the uninfected cells? And in the infected cells, um, essentially, there is a complete shutdown of host biology. So um, it's actually a difficult experiment to do because SARS-CoV-2 destroys probably about 80% of all host mRNA during the course of the infection. So when you're sequencing infected cells, the vast, vast majority of reads are coming from virus. Um, so all you're left with are the few host genes that you capture left over to try and make any sense of what's going on in those infected cells. Um, but that said, actually, it is quite clear what happens in those cells, and that is you see a bit of a stress response, but really it's a, a generation of NF-kappa B. So it's this very common transcription factor involved in the stress response, as well as many other things. And all we really see in SARS-CoV-2 infected cells is virus biology going on and really, really strong NF-kappa B signaling, which is, which is a really interesting story that I don't have time to talk about today, but um, basically the virus needs NF-kappa B. When you want to look at the uninfected cells, like I was saying, it's really hard to do that through single cell sequencing because it degrades so much of the host mRNA. And so we do this through a variety of other techniques. Um, I didn't really want to go through all this data other than to say, if we compare different multiplicities of infection, so this would be um, you know, uh, um, one cell for every, or one virus for every 50 cells, one for every five cells, or two viruses for every cell. So you're just multiplying the total number of infectious particles per cell in a given condition. And all I want you to appreciate is that um, you get these different, so these are uh, called volcano plots, you're looking at the transcriptional response, the virus infection. And it is to say that if you take what we just showed you into account, knowing that these cells that are infected are only inducing NF-kappa B, everything that's not NF-kappa B here has to be coming from bystander effects of those cells. And that's where we really see the high amounts of inflammation and cytokine signaling. So just, just keep that in mind, but we'll, we'll get more into this later. Okay, so I'm going to keep everything at a very high level today. No molecular biology is not meant to be the point here. But, you know, infection starts, as I mentioned, you're going to get your ORF1A, ORF1B to make this, you know, kidney-shaped RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And then you're going to start making those subgenomic RNAs. And that's when you start producing a lot of this double-stranded RNA that we mentioned. And it's that double-stranded RNA that would normally under, you know, um, um, standard conditions be recognized by our host cells. And so our host cells have a variety of different so-called pattern recognition receptors. The two most famous ones are Rigai and MDA5. Uh, Rigai recognizes double-stranded RNA that has a triphosphate on the end instead of um, a cap or an alpha phosphate, whereas MDA5 actually likes the, the actual double helical RNA structure. And these all culminate at the mitochondria. They induce a very complicated signal transduction pathway that I spent years working on, um, but now I'm reduced it to just a few arrows. Um, and that is to say it all goes into the nucleus, and the main job of the infected cell is really to induce the production of type 1 interferon. Um, so that's most notably like interferon beta and the interferon alphas. And the reason why they do that is that this cell is essentially dead anyways. By the time this happens, the cell is going to die. But um, the induction of interferon 
should happen, and this is actually a really important point I want to keep getting back to with this group, that the, the induction of interferon will happen before viral aggress. And because of that, it means that the interferon molecule can, can um, communicate to surrounding cells about this eminent threat of incoming virus replication before the virus actually gets there. So that warning message comes through this separate signal transduction pathway, a 50-year-old pathway, very well known. But really, we're talking about this type 1 interferon more so than type 3, although they're very similar. But needless to say, you form another transcription factor complex, but this one is involved in the upregulation of about 200 to 300 different genes, which render those cells far more resistant to viral infection, um, far more capable of battling infection, and will respond much stronger should they get infected. And so this is part of the process to ramp up the overall response to an infecting agent. Now, of course, um, any virus that you've ever heard of that causes disease has to be able to break some of these arms because otherwise they would be neutralized and we would never have studied them or know about them. And SARS-CoV-2 is no surprise, um, an exception to, not, not an exception to this rule. And so actually this looks exactly like the data that came out of SARS-CoV from circa 2003. Same players, same antagonistic strategies. You can block nuclear export. You can shut down the host ribosome. You can degrade the host RNAs. You can take proteases and kind of post factors. And ultimately you're going to mess with the way the host can respond. And so again, just to take a really high level, in the very first couple of cells that get infected, you know, that replication is going to start generating these so-called pathogen-associated uh, molecular patterns. In the case of SARS-CoV-2, this is um, undoubtedly um, the production of actual double-stranded RNA. Uh, that gets sensed, activates a bunch of transcription factors, and like I was saying earlier, those cells that first get infected really have these two major jobs to do. And so this is the one I first talked about. I would call this the call to arms. You want to release interferon into the cell to tell your neighboring cells, get ready, threat's coming, get prepared. So call to arms. The other one is essentially a call for reinforcement. That is the production of chemokines rather than pro-inflammatory material. And what you're doing here is you're going to start creating uh, a trail so that the professional antigen presenting cells, the DCs, macrophages, monocytes, T cells, B cells, are all now going to come to the site of infection following that trail. So that's that's our reinforcement of the, you know, the heavy hitting adaptive immune response. And so they're all kind of connected and they all start at the same place. However, because um, SARS-CoV-2 specifically knocks out components required for interferon signaling, it's very good at shutting down the call for arms. And so we do see a good block of IRFs in the infected cells. This is why we don't see interferon coming from infected cells. But as I was mentioning, one of the oddities of this virus is that it leaves nf cap b on. Um, and it does this because um, it needs a lot of membranes for its replication, and nf kappa b generates a lot of membrane um, metabolism. And so if you actually block nf kappa b um, you'll actually stop this call for reinforcement, which might be bad if you're trying to fight off virus infection. But in this particular example, you also shut off virus replication. So it's, it's a unique property to this virus-host interaction, but it's also a major contributor to what comes next. All right, so what does come next? Um, so we're going to jump into the hamster model. So, um, you know, my lab started this, doing this in like January of 2020, right when the outbreak started. We initially worked with uh, ferrets, and then it quickly became apparent that hamsters were a much better model than ferrets. Uh, and so we've been working with hamsters ever since. But these four groups really led the way in showing that to be true. And again, a lot of this work was built off of what we knew circa 2003 with regards to you know, human ACE2 expression versus hamster ACE2 expression versus mouse. And the mouse one just really isn't compatible with SARS-CoV-2 spike unless you adapt it. Um, and so what's beautiful about the hamsters is that they really do a great job at mimicking COVID. There's in fact very, very few things they don't phenocopy. Um, so this comes out of Yoshi Kaoka's lab, another flu researcher who jumped into the SARS-CoV-2 field. But other than to say that, you know, your lungs should look like they do on the left here. These are hamster lungs. But when you get SARS-CoV-2, your lungs get cloudy. The medical term for this is brown glass opacity. But basically, your, your, your lungs are leaking fluid. Um, and this is what the definition of the respiratory uh, syndrome is. And so it happens to hamsters as well. Um, the hamster model itself is incredibly um, robust um, with regards to um, how susceptible they are and how often the infections catch. Um, and so this little graph here on the left, actually, I wish more people would pay attention to this because you'll find that the vast majority of studies that are published 
use something like 10 to the 5 PFU uh, for a single inoculation to start an infection, which I would argue is way too high and has other repercussions when you come in that high. Um, we can actually do this with a single PFU, but um, the reason we don't generally use that is because you find that some animals catch it and some do not in a rather stochastic manner. So in general, we either we generally use 100 uh, PFU, which is dedicated here. You can see out of these uh, eight, seven animals, they all get infected. They all show the same titers. Whereas in this guy, you can see that this 10 PFU, these three got infected. And then this one guy here clearly did not get infected. But then you have uh, cage transmission events where somebody here gave it to this guy, which this is also a great model for transmission. And so needless to say, we're going to work always with this range here with 100 PFU. Uh, and then sometimes when we want a nice comparator, we'll compare it to flu. Uh, and so flu is our own bread and butter. It's another RNA virus. We have this is this actually strain is the pet, the so-called swine flu that caused the pandemic in 2009. And you can see that the course in hamsters is, is kind of comparable. So we see when we infect with 100 PFU, you get rapid replication of SARS-CoV-2. This is the original Wuhan strain. Uh, and at day seven, basically the population crashes and there's no more infection after by day eight, we see neutralizing antibodies and the hamsters recover. They're really modeling your average like 20 to 40 year old uh, in the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, whereas here on the right, uh, California uh, flu virus, again, it's an RNA virus, it's also in the respiratory tract. So that's why we like it as a comparator, totally different virus biology, totally different virus family. And you can see that the kinetics are a little different here. The virus starts going on day five. Any comparisons that we're going to do here, though, we're either going to look on day three, where the two titers were comparable, or we're going to look well past day 14, where both viruses have been cleared. And please feel free to interrupt me if uh, you have any specific questions. Um, okay, so um, just this overview of the model itself, you infect, this is just staining for the nucleoprotein of SARS-CoV-2, just to give you a sense of what it's actually doing to these animals. Um, and so even though they recover, you can see that in the large bronchi on day two, you start getting this brown staining. These are the end stains. And these are your ACE2 expressing cells involved in your oxygen carbon dioxide exchange. You can see the virus rapidly expands in this tissue until basically the large bronchi are dead. Uh, they're full of damage. There's no more ciliated cells there. There's no more pneumocytes there. And then you see this incoming blast of neutrophils coming to uh, neutrophils and macrophages coming to basically repair the area. And as a result, you lose your brown state of large bronchi, though you can also see the walls are all gone. And now the virus goes kind of interstitial space where the lung is before eventually it gets cleared. And by day 14, you now ironically, you can actually still get very good staining. So there's clearly some debris left over from the infection, which I also think is relevant, but different topic for a different day. Um, but ultimately, it is cleared. Um, and then if you contrast this with, um, when you contrast this with um, HED staining, um, you can see that you do get that robust inflammation. So if you remember from what I just mentioned, you know, one of the things that's unique about SARS-CoV-2 is that the cells that are directly infected are still uh, releasing NF-kappa B, and so you're still getting that call for reinforcement. And so this is why SARS-CoV-2 has despite the fact that it's blocking a lot of the antiviral defenses, we're getting this massive immune cell infiltration. So you can see here that while peak virus is on day four, the lung is just completely filled with uh, immune cells. And these include neutrophils, macrophages, monocytes, T cells, and B cells. Basically the entire professional uh, humoral immune response comes to the lung to deal with this infection. And this really becomes the problem. So by day eight here, the animal has no virus left but you can imagine that if this inflammation was left unchecked, this would cause a lot of problems. And this is where comorbidities come in, and this is why uh, this virus uh, still poses so much danger, despite the fact that most healthy individuals can fight it without problem. So um, just a few little examples. So if you take a zoom in on the lung, this is kind of cool. So this is a large bronchi, and this is a large bronchi that is uninfected. So we took this picture for a specific reason. You can see the walls and the cilia are still intact here. And then beside a lar every large bronchi like this, you also have an artery. And that's for obvious reasons that the blood traveling through here needs to exchange oxygen with uh, the respiratory and the air interface here. But there should not be this material in between here that you see here and here. And this is edema. So this is evidence that the response to virus infection is causing a leaking of many of the immune cells and vice versa. You would imagine that some of the lung material would also go into this space. So that's, that's happening. Uh, and that's what's causing that, that, remember when we were rotating the hamster lung, we could see that um, kind of cloudy area. That's what's causing the clouding. 
If you zoom in further, you can actually see layers upon layers of neutrophils that lay on top of those large bronchi. That's because all of the pneumocytes are dead. Um, and so the uh, host response is trying to protect that material and that surface area to give you some time to generate new ciliated cells, which it will do eventually. And then if you zoom in even further, you know, you have to just kind of believe me on this one because the pathologists tell me it's so, but um, these kind of markings here and the way that the H&E stains here is just showing you that these cells are dying a really gr gruesome death. We see evidence of basically every type of cell death and every type of apoptosis when scanning the lungs in this way. And so while um, you breathe in, um, initially what's happening is vast majority of variants starting from Wuhan all the way to Delta, you would breathe it in an infection with sinus simultaneously happen in the trachea, the nasal cavity, and in the bronchi, uh, all essentially at the same time. Uh, this is not true for Omicron, interestingly, and what happens for Omicron actually will largely support the hypothesis I'm putting forward in that Omicron establishes an infection in the pharynx only or the trachea only, and doesn't actually get into the lung initially, and uh, just remember that little point for later. Oops. Um, okay, so you do an infection at either a low MOI, this is going to be an MOI of 10, or you remember that really high one of 10 to the 5. And really the only difference here that you can appreciate is that when you look at, so this is day 1, day 3, day 7, day 14, day 21, something like that. Um, but all you can really appreciate is that when you do a high MOI, rather than having this no response initially on day 1, obviously you just, you know, jump into full speed inflammation at a high MOI, uh, whereas at a low MOI, you're a little bit more linear in your trajectory of how you respond. But I'm showing you this only in that these really are the three primary places where we see replication, and you can appreciate that the host uh, is responding dramatically. So this is just RNA-seq data, and this is just a gene set enrichment analysis for interferon alpha-stimulated genes. And so all you're looking at is red means up, lots and lots of inflammation going on. Okay. While that's happening, though, your virus is also going up, right? So your virus is replicating the trachea, it's already replicating the lungs, but it's also replicating wherever it can find ACE2 expressing cells. And so that also includes the olfactory epithelium. And so we went into the olfactory epithelium to see what was going on there. Um, so for those of you who are unaware of how olfactory epithelium works, when you breathe in through your nose, the air zips across here where all these uh, neural uh, dendrites sit looking for you know, the ligand that they can sense and, you know, by definition, smell. And the structure of these neurons is kept into place by these strange uh, endothelial cells called testicular cells. So they really are supporting cells. And then, of course, there's lots of other fibroblasts and stem cells in this compartment that maintain our olfaction system, basically. So as you breathe in, you know, um, um, small molecules that, that you know, provide the sense of smell, are detected by these neurons, they come in, they go run through your olfactory and into your brain, and they allow you to both smell things, but also the olfactory system is connected to all kinds of other things, which um, I'll talk about at the very end. Um, so one of the things that we did uh, in our hamster model was we did single cell sequencing in the same kind of kinetics, so mock one, three, and 10 days post infection. So remember 10 days, our virus is already gone. What we're doing is we're actually cutting the nose off and doing single nuclei isolation of the nose, and we're trying to find out just what's happening in the nose. Uh, and it's actually a really nice study, so you can see these types of cells in the nose that we just discussed. And then the question is, once you have the sequencing data, you can ask, you know, where is the virus and you know, what's happening in this space? And so the first thing we do is we say, where is the virus? So um, these guys are obviously the, the maps uh, that you see up here. Um, and now what you're looking at are, are the reads that map back to the SARS-CoV-2 genome. So that's you see in blue here. And so what I want you to appreciate is if you look over here, you can see that there's a few dots of blue here, but the vast majority of blue is all along uh, this space here and all along this space here. And these are all of our cystacular uh, cells, our sus cells. And what's also interesting about our sus cells, if you look at the overall numbers as a percentage from here to here to here, you can see that they're actually dropping quite precipitously. So we lose about 70% of sus cells in the first uh, two days of infection. And then interestingly, by day three, you can see that there's still lots of infection going on in the sus cells, but the population is dying, so it's running out of material. And interestingly, now what you see is that when you're looking for SARS-CoV-2 reads, they're actually coming up in microglia and macrophages, which is clearly, you know, um, antigen-presenting cells, picking up this debris, and now presenting it or uh, digesting it away or just cleaning up the debris from the dead cells. So, and then by day 10, virus is all gone. Um, 
Moreover, if you look at something like ISG15, so this is a nice gene stands for interferon stimulated gene 15. So this is a nice way of looking at the host interferon response. What I want you to appreciate here is that our sus cells that were infected, you can actually see here that the sus cells are not inducing ISG15. This is exactly in line with what I just finished telling you, that the virus in the cell that it's actively infecting, it, it is winning that war and the cell is doing nothing that the virus doesn't want it to, which would include no interferon production. But you can see that overall, all of the cells now are responding to interferon and that is coming from those uh, antigen presenting cells. So those you know, uh, resident macrophages and resident microglia are professional interferon producing cells. So they can engulf the you know, dead and dying debris from the sus cells, pick it up, realize that within that uh, endocytotic package that they just picked up, that there's lots of inflammatory material there, and then they release a lot of these signals like interferon to prime the neighboring cells so that the system still exists, you still get interferon, but it's a little late, right? It's a few days delayed from what it should be because of this dynamic. Um, and then I'm almost done with this topic, but other than to say that because of all this inflammation, what you see is that the expression of those receptors seen here in red, so just a component of those receptors, basically uh, disappears and goes, uh, goes dark. And this is exactly the reason why we all lose our sense of smell generally when you get um, SARS-CoV-2 is because the amount of replication in the nose on day two and three causes a significant amount of inflammatory signaling. And now the bandwidth of your olfactory neuron spends half of its time upregulating interferon genes instead of upregulating up many of those receptors required for smell, and that's why many lose their sense of smell. And uh, as I was saying, hamsters very much like people are great phenocopiers of this disease, and so um, my people have had a great time doing this experiment. But for example, this is a great place where we can use our benchmarking of flu. So we have three three cohorts here: um, mock. Cohort, a cohort infected with flu and then recovered, and then uh, infected with SARS CoV 2. And so this is three days prior to infection versus 15 days prior after infection. And all we're doing here is you, uh, you starve the animals for about 12 hours, then you give them some Cocoa Puffs so they realize they love, or Cocoa Krispies, so they love Cocoa Krispies, and then you bury the Cocoa Krispies in a new cage under, the, under their, um, their like, cornmeal that they stand on, and you just simply measure how much time it takes them to find all of it and eat it all. Uh, which is a really robust assay. So you can see that in the flu animals, like within like a minute, they have all picked up all the Cocoa Krispies and eaten them all. Whereas in the SARS-CoV-2, you can see that they're much more delayed and in fact, some of them don't ever find SARS-CoV-2. Um, but you know, you wait 15 days out and in fact, then everybody is good at it again and all is well in the world. So we do actually have the ability to state that anosmia also happens in hamsters. And we've been using this assay not only to determine what causes anosmia, but also now how to treat anosmia. And uh, we just had an article in the Times, and so I can tell you that we've gotten calls from all over the country with some crazy people with some crazy phenotypes as it relates to smell, and so I hope we can help those people at some point. All right, so um, I'm hoping this is on par with what we were, we were hoping for, but um, my big take home here really is that if you just understand what happened in the nose, that actually is a perfect microcosm for what happens in long COVID in the entire body. Um, and so here the idea is that very much like the infection of sus cells causing indirect effects on other things, um, I'm going to try and convince this group that infection in the lungs causes circulating interferon, that interferon primes all of the other organs. And in so doing, because interferon gets there faster than virus, it actually prevents virus dissemination to these organs, and it protects them because of its messiness. And I'm gonna try and show you that that's true. And so just let's take a step back. Um, so here we're gonna take eight hamsters, we're going to infect eight hamsters with uh, you know, 100 PFU intranasally, and we're going to wait uh, three days, which was peak viral titers, and then we're gonna do a necropsy and look at every organ. And what I want you to appreciate here is that we're doing, everything is by plaque assay, so we're not big fans of just measuring RNA, that's not enough. We want to know that there's actually infectious material there. And so you can see that when you check the trachea, so here what you do is you take a little piece of trachea at day three, we homogenize it in like a porcelain bead homogenizer uh, in PBS, and then we take that supernatant and we directly plaque that onto Vero cells. And you can see eight out of eight samples from trachea from eight different animals, all plaques with infectious units. Same is true for lung. But then when you look at the other organs, you can see it's a little bit more stochastic. So we never see anything in the liver. 
the heart, we get it a few times, it's not consistent. And remember, the heart is literally in between, sandwiched between this massive infection. The olfactory bulb, this is a pretty common one, so five out of eight, not every time, but you can see a lot of the olfactory bulb animals are getting infected. Um, whereas the brain, we see no virus, the spleen, we see no virus, the pancreas, we see no virus, the kidney, we see no virus, and the GI, we have this one virus here, but I think this is probably a result of the animal swallowing some virus, and then we just catch it in the GI tract. So overall, it's a respiratory virus, it's in the airways, and it's nowhere else. However, when you look by sequencing, you can find RNA there. So there is some suggestion that like maybe viral RNA is in circulation, or maybe the virus gets there, but the infection just doesn't catch. So just keep that in mind. And what's interesting about this, though, is that when you look at the RNA, so this is now deep sequencing data, all of this is publicly available. Um, but if you look at I think it's triplicate or quadruplicate samples of all these different tissues following infection, even though we saw no infectious virus in any tissue here except for lung and olfactory bulb, you can tell by the uh, host response of this that there is no distinguishing factor. You're seeing the same response in all of the organs, regardless of whether there's a productive infection or no infection, which would suggest that there's a lot of inflammation happening in animals. Um, moreover, if you take the whole blood from animals, and I should mention, like all of this data, we, we consolidate, we corroborate everything in COVID cadavers or uh, clinical samples. So I'm not showing you anything that doesn't happen in people as well. But since we do so much work in hamsters, I just tend to show the work we did in hamsters. So in whole blood, for example, though, you also see this interferon signature. But when you take whole blood and you try and plaque it, there is no virus in the blood. Again, true for humans, we know that when you do blood transfusions, uh, between people that were infected versus people that were naive. We did not see any evidence of, of um, transmission. So it really seems like the virus is, is either at incredibly low levels, neutralized in the blood, never gets into the blood, and that everything we see here is just a lot of inflammation coming from cytokines derived from all the damage that's happening in the lung, just like what was happening in the nasal epithelium between the sus cells and your olfactory uh, neurons. And in fact, the inflammation goes so deep and so penetrating that even when we do single cell on bone marrow, so this is, these are cells that have not yet even seen the light of day. Um, there is no virus in the bone marrow at all, ever. Um, however, you can see again that the same response, so there's our friend ISG15, and these are all interferon stimulated genes. Sorry, this was a little pre-annotation of the hamster data. But what you can appreciate here is purple is uninfected and orange is infected, and you're getting this massive differentiation of granulocytes into neutrophils. That is, uh, again, an interferon signature, and again, a signature of what SARS-CoV-2 does to individuals. And so we really just see this inflammation everywhere. And this goes also to COVID toe, thus the title. We can take the toes of hamsters. We also see interferon there, just like we do in COVID toe rash individuals. And so the question I'd like to pose to this group, because I think it's a really interesting question, I'm going to show you a really cool piece of data that just came out, is that this idea that just like in the sus cells, it's true that if you, well, actually, you'll probably jump there up. So the question simply is, does the inflammation induced at the site of infection actually prevent further infection in other organs? That's, that's the question. Uh, and so the first piece of evidence to answer that question comes from a, a lab out of uh, Belgium. This is um, uh, Johan Neltz's, the Elsa's group. Um, and so they had uh, some knockout hamsters. Actually, they got them from the US here. So these are wild type golden hamsters, just like we use here. We have stat two knockout hamsters. This is going to short circuit only type one interferon signaling, or IL-28 receptor knockout hamsters. This is going to short circuit type three interferon signaling, which you'll see makes no difference. We could have cut it out of here, but this is from their paper. Um, and all I wanted to show you is that when we cut out stat two signaling, um, that these organs where we didn't, we, so this is not my data, but traditionally when we don't see a lot of viral RNA or a lot of, when we see no infectious particles, you're now seeing a significant uptick in uh, virus infections when you short circuit interferon. So this is, you could argue that, okay, maybe in the absence of interferon, you're just getting a much higher viral load in the animal and that's causing the phenotype. Or maybe like I, I was proposing, the interferon caused at the site of infection is actually protecting other organs. And so to that last point, another piece of evidence that would suggest that it's something funny going on here is that when you make organoids in culture, and so I know a lot of modelers like to model in this because it's much more controlled, but you know, if you take a ex vivo approach to this and you do really detailed kinetics, what you can actually find is that many, many cell types are susceptible to virus infection. So we can infect dopaminic neurons, we can infect uh, cardiomyocytes really well, endothelial cells, liver cells, pancreatic cells, um, cardiomyocytes, but these other cells not so much. But 
again, cardiomyocytes, we didn't see productive infection in the heart. And so there is this weird disparity between working ex vivo and working in vivo, which could be explained by this hypothesis of interferon spread. And so if I'm right, then this experiment would be an interesting one, which is the one we just most recently did. And so the idea here would be, again, if you remember the model, instead of breathing in and demanding that we cause damage in the airways here, what happens if we put infectious virus directly into the bloodstream? Because there, there will now be no interferon priming. So the virus has direct access to all of the organs. And now you can determine whether or not there is other susceptible organs that could be infected should the lung not have protected them in the real world scenario. And so we did this experiment. Uh, we only did it on four hamsters, so pretty preliminary still. But what's amazing about this experiment, uh, I simply love, is that you get a productive infection in the kidney. And so when you do an IV infection, you have a blazing amount. Actually, the titers are almost as high in the kidney as they would normally be in the lung. Um, so we see a kidney infections and we see a liver infection. So we see productive infection in these two organs which coincides nicely with what we saw in the organoid data. And then interestingly, out of all of these animals, only one of the four animals showed infectious virus in the lung, even though the lungs are all primed with interferon, suggesting that it goes in both directions. So if the infection were to start in the lung, all of your organs have this inflammatory response, which isn't great if you have some kind of comorbidity. If you have a weak kidney and your kidney gets inflamed because of infection in your lung, that can certainly cause kidney problems. But if you are a healthy individual otherwise, then that is going to protect your other organs. Whereas the IV injection, you now get productive infection in distal organs that's now protecting your lung, which is a pretty cool little dynamic, I think. And then, so the last thing I want to talk about with regards to the inflammation is that overall, what you'll see is that inflammation goes back down to baseline at two weeks, which is kind of what you would expect. And so here, again, we're going to benchmark everything to, to flu, and I'm, I'm almost done here. Um, and so if you look at the lungs, for example, on day three, both flu and SARS-CoV-2, um, you can see induced, sorry, blue is now up. Uh, we can see a log two-fold change, pretty high of all these interferon and inflammatory genes. And there's, it's essentially indistinguishable between SARS and flu. Same amount of inflammation. Um, however, by day 31, again, you can see that in both cases for SARS and for flu, we go back down to baseline. So all of our antiviral defenses go up, our inflammation goes up. We make antibodies, we neutralize virus, everything goes back down, everybody's happy, everybody moves on. Interestingly, though, when you go to the olfactory bulb, um, which we spent some time on earlier, here you can see that SARS is a little bit more robust than flu. That's because SARS can replicate in those sus cells and flu cannot. But what's really interesting is that when you wait 31 days, when everything is supposed to be resolved, of course, flu has resolved, just like you would have expected. But as you can see here, the 31-day post-infection SARS, where there is no virus anywhere in this animal, um, you can see that it has not changed its transcriptional signature. So it has not gone back down to baseline. And so this actually prompted us to go further into the brain. So just as a kind of bang home point, three days post-infection, you can see virus in the olfactory uh, olfaction system. 31 days, there is no virus there, despite the fact that all of these uh, are still very much primed. And when we go deeper into the brain and we pull out cerebellum, prefrontal cortex, olfactory bulbs, stratum, thalamus, trigeminal ganglia, and get a sense of what's going on here, what you can see is that basically that inflammation travels from the olfactory epithelium in two different areas of the brain, most notably the striatum and the thalamus. And so what's happening here is that because your sense of smell is so connected to other aspects of your neural biology, you are getting lasting impacts to these other areas of your brain. And these actually match the same areas that just came out in um, the Times covered it yesterday, I think it was the Nature paper that they were showing in uh, from their Oxford study in long COVID patients that there are parts of the brain that are shrinking. Uh, and one of them was the striatum and one of them was right along the thalamus. And so we think this is probably very much related to the fact that this inflammation is finding its way into the brain, even in the absence of virus. And so if we actually perform then um, different kinds of behavioral tests on these hamsters that have recovered 31 days out, 60 days out, we even have one year out now, you can also find that they show examples of what we love to refer to as long COVID. You can certainly argue against that. Um, none of these behavioral tests have been designed for hamsters. So, you know, you've a little bit left to interpretation. But needless to say, if you take these are mock and flu together, which there's no significant difference. Here we put marbles in the cage and we determine how long it takes the animal to bury the marble because rodents tend to not like to have foreign things in their environment. Um, and what we find is that the animals that have recovered from SARS-CoV-2 long ago take a much longer time, um, um, or actually just bury much less marbles, and that they are usually just kind of crunched in the corner, scared. 
Uh, and similar, this one is um, time to first mobility is basically your it's a swim test where you put the animals in water and you wait to see how long it takes for them to give up. And this is basically a measurement of anxiety or stress. And what you can appreciate is again, the SARS-CoV-2 animals are underperforming their control counterparts, suggesting that like people, the impact and transcriptional changes you're seeing in the brain do have manifestations as, as a long kind of uh, sequelae. And so that's, that's my big take home talk. So my major four take home points was one that the natural biology of coronaviruses um, is very pro-inflammatory because it can induce so much double-stranded RNA and induces such a heavy amount of cell death. Um, it also blocks a lot of signaling, which is not unusual um, in the infected cells, but what is unusual is that it leaves NF-kappa B on. And since NF-kappa B is largely responsible for that call for reinforcement, this is why we get such an intense um, immune infiltration, and this is why dexamethasone is one of the primary uh, uses of treatment because that is really the cause of most diseases once you're in an intensive care unit. Um, the one I'm trying to really convince you on is that the circling cytokines that result from that infection are actually priming all of the other organs and preventing further infections in them. So it's actually a good thing that it happens. Unless you're old, you have a comorbidity, and some of those organs are already damaged or weak, in which case that inflammation itself can kill you, which is why morbidity goes up with age. Um, and lastly, um, I would also argue that because of this unique attribute of causing inflammation in the olfactory bulb for such a sustained period of time is also the major contributor to what we refer to as long COVID in some individuals. And so, you know, as far as modeling goes, um, I've always loved this idea. Maybe it's really hard to do, but one of the things that I think is a really great puzzle, which modeling would be beautiful to try and capture, would be to determine the speed at which different cytokines operate and function from the source of infection versus the speed and viral burst size of virus coming out of that same size of infection to determine if you can actually predict the pathology or the amount of damage or systemic infection you could see from a virus based on the relationship between amount of cytokines and type of cytokines induced versus burst size of virus and where virus infection initially starts. And for example, Omicron has proven to be a really good way of supporting this model that I'm putting forward because Omicron has such a high affinity for ACE2 that basically every ACE2 expressing cell that it sees in the trachea, that's where infection starts. And so you don't see infection in the uh, nasal turbinates, nor do you see it in the lungs initially, it's only in the trachea. And so the damage in Omicron happens in the trachea, which then primes even the lung from being infected. So Omicron is its own worst enemy by, by having such a high affinity for ACE2, which I think is a beautiful way because it's kind of a natural way to stop this pandemic because the virus is getting better and better at transmitting, but it's also getting so specific in where it starts its site of infection that its, it's overall um, pathogenicity is becoming attenuated. Um, and then if you really want to go further in connections, I would also argue that you could take this so far as to help me explain why mammals dropped RNA interference for interferon, um, which is a bigger story, but it has to do with traveling and how big of a body we are and communicating from cell to cell versus something like trees, um, which are also big, but use RNA interference to like defend themselves. But um, I will leave that open if people are interested in what the hell I'm talking about there. Uh, and with that, you know, I have to first thank uh, all the funding agencies that support this work and all the collaborators who contributed it and all my people who work on this. And um, there's way too many to mention, but um, that is to say, um, I'm happy to take questions and this by no means was a, an effort of me. I'm just presenting the, uh, the, the fun, uh, flashy, uh, polished data for you guys. So thank you. Ruchira. What you got? Yes, thank you for that that great talk. And yes, I had I had uh, seen your your work in the the Times article. It's it's great to have you with us explaining more more about the the science. So I had uh, three questions. So one was about the uh, the RNA debris. Is would that be like naked RNA, or would that be in exosomes or some kind of vesicles? So so the first question is where would that debris be? The second one was, I was very interested about um, your hypothesis about the, the long COVID from the, um, the cytokines. And there was this other study that came out of, I think it was uh, ISB, Institute for Systems Biology, where they, were, they had done a longitudinal study um, 
and we're looking at autoantibodies as possibly being involved. So um, would you say that that's uh, related to this cytokine uh, mechanism or is that so something separate? And the third question is uh, taking you up on that, you know, RNA interference versus interferon. So um, if you want to expand on that. So those awesome. are the three questions. Okay, Richard, I will give those a shot. So first one, nature of the debris. Um, working really, really hard on the nature of debris. So for the longest time, um, I do not believe that exosomes can ever deliver enough material to induce an inflammatory response to distal sites. Like they don't, they don't carry enough material to do that. So that one is a no. Um, I initially thought, uh, and this still might be true, that it's actually um, like apoptotic bodies or even rabinucleic protein complexes where it's the subgenomic material, which is actually mRNA. So you can, if, if that makes its way into cell, it can be translated. Um, but in reality, in order to see inflammation that lasts for 14 days, what you're really going to need is the ability to self-amplify that material. So the only way that this makes sense to have um, system-wide inflammation in the absence of infectious particles in all of your organs would be to either have um, an environment in which every infection that starts after a certain point is abortive. And I think that's really where I'm headed now. So the idea would be that because interferon has really hit every cell by say day six, even though there's still infectious virus there, now every time the virus finds a new cell, that cell has been primed and has, uh, is coming much more equipped to this battle to fight off the infection. So the infection is no longer productive. And we can model this in vitro too. If you take any A5, A5 or A2 cells and just put on even a tiny bit of interferon alpha and then try and infect those cells, you will see RNA, you will see some evidence of the virus trying to undergo its biology, but it will never be a productive infection. And so I think the short answer to your question is the debris is actually either virus hitting cells that are now no longer susceptible, so it's a change in host, not a change in virus, or it is actually the generation of enough virus material where it is it has to be, at a minimum, a piece of subgenomic RNA that encodes um, um, probably either the polymerase, so like a broken piece of subject pulmonary RNA that is ORF1, ORF1, A, and B, so that once you're in the cell, you can actually self-amplify for a bit and just make aberrant RNA and a lot of interferon. But to me, it's between those two possibilities, and between those two possibilities, I think I like the first one better, but if I gave this talk to you two weeks ago, I would have actually been talking about the second point, so I'm not quite sure yet. Um, so the second one is is sort of it's not quite infectious, but it's a little bit infectious. Would would that be fair to say? Yeah. So I think the idea would be that you know as a cell is dying, you know you have apoptotic blebbing bodies. To to your point, but those bodies that are blebbing off are going to have spike made on their surface, so they they do have the ability to get into ACE2 expressing cells. It's not productive in microglia or macrophages. So if this material gets engulfed by uh, one of those cells, it's not going to result in a productive infection. But I can envision uh, like an apoptotic body going through the bloodstream, hitting an ACE2 expressing receptor, or, or maybe it's got enough endogenous stuff on it that it fuses with some other cell. But if within that body you have even one subgenomic RNA and some polymerase, that is enough material to amplify that subgenomic RNA, drive translation of that subgenomic RNA. And since the vast, vast majority of RNA made by this virus is N, the end protein itself is an antagonist. So it's gonna be inflammatory because its RNA is double-stranded. It's gonna be inflammatory because it's gonna block a lot of nuclear import. And so you're gonna get a lot of inflammation in other dead cells. And now you have about two weeks of time for that to just churn around and cause problems. And so it's somewhere in that space, but I haven't, we haven't quite nailed it down yet. And we're, we're definitely working hard at it, but it's a hard thing to, to uh, define exactly. Very interesting, um, thank you. Yeah, of course, those are good questions. And so your long COVID autoantibody story, I mean, this idea of antibodies to interfere on, like, I don't know why we're all talking about it like it's a brand new thing. It's been around for a long time. I don't think it's novel to COVID. I don't think it's causing COVID. But you could certainly imagine that antibodies to interfere on, you know, based on what I just finished telling you, is that, you know, interfere on, um, meaning all of them, type 1, type 2, and type 3, um, are all playing a role in helping prime these distal organs from getting infected again. So if you are an individual that makes higher than normal antibodies and is neutralizing your own interferon response, it's going to mean that you're going to have higher viral levels everywhere, including the lung. You're also going to get some probably virus replication at low levels in all of the distal organs, certainly the kidney and the liver, which we saw when we went IV. 
And that's also going to happen in your cystacular cells, where if you are making autoantibodies, you probably are less likely to lose your sense of smell, but you're going to have sustained inflammation for even longer because you have an even larger viral load to deal with. And so if that is the main cause, I would argue that all COVID is, is sustained inflammation penetrating the brain. So of course, in the absence of you know, a robust interferon response, that's going to happen more often and would correlate with COVID. So that all makes perfect sense. And then your last question is a really big one. So um, it's it actually, so this is something I was very interested in pre-COVID in that, um, and it's really like a whole other talk, but you know, long story short, in uh, prokaryotes and bacteria and archaea, 99% of all viruses are DNA, single-stranded DNA, double-stranded DNA. And so as a result, their defense systems are restriction enzymes and CRISPR targeting DNA for the vast majority of, of prokaryotic organisms. Then when you switch to eukaryogenesis and like the birth of plants, what's interesting about that is that because now the nucleus the, and all the new uh, membranes, we actually see a complete reversal of that vi virome trend. And so in plants, it's 99% RNA viruses and in insects, it's kind of a weird mix, but it's definitely more RNA viruses than DNA viruses. And so as a result, you know, plants and early animals, meaning invertebrates and protists, um, had to develop an entirely new strategy where CRISPR restriction enzymes were now going to fail them. And so what you see is the repurposing of the um, RNA, um, RNA's machinery of CRISPR. So the type 2 RNA's machinery is a pair of scissors that's involved in cutting the guide RNA from you know, from the phage genome so that the archaea or the bacteria can then cut it, right? And what you see is basically a reinvention of that system of using small RNAs coupled to a nuclease. But in the case of early animals and early plants, what we get is we, we borrow that same RNAs and we're now going to couple it with Argonaut and we're going to make basically a CRISPR system targeting RNA instead of DNA, thus giving us RNA interference, right? RNA interference is such a successful little invention in evolutionary time. We actually see that animals and plants later split. And so both of them have similar RNAi pathways that are related to each other. But then you actually see in animals and in, um, and in uh, plants, both of them duplicate all of those genes numerous times. And half of the genes continue to be used for antiviral RNA. And the other half of the genes become um, microRNA biology. So same biology, small RNA, nucleases, but now totally used in development, having nothing to do with antiviral factors. And microRNA biology exists in invertebrates, plants, and in us. So that has carried through from time in, ever since it was invented. Yet when we get to mammals, we seemingly drop RNA interference and we gain interferon. So that was a very, very long uh, caption of like the evolution of antiviral defenses. But what's really interesting about it from my point of view is trying to figure out why we bother to do that. Because you know, an easy argument initially would be that it's about our size. That you know, when you are a small insect or invertebrate or a single-celled organism, uh, making an approach that requires you capturing a small RNA from the genome of a pathogen means that all you have to do is transport it to a couple of cells or around a cell or a few neighboring cells, and it can provide a systemic, very good defense against you. And this has been shown in Drosophila and flies. And for example, they have really good transporters to move the siRNAs from cell to cell to cell. And if you break one of those transporters, those animals all become hypersusceptible to virus infection. In plants, it's a totally different system. When plants, they have plasma desmatis, so they basically have a microfluidic plumbing system. And so in a plant, even if you're a giant oak tree, once you start making small RNAs that are antiviral, you can quickly send them through the plasma desmata of the plant and have a circulatory system. And so in reality, we could have evolved to have a hybrid between these two systems and had a great defense for viruses just like everybody else does. But instead, we traded it in for interferon. And the reason I think we did that is a really hard one to prove, but I think this is where mathematically modeling could come in, and this is why I've brought it up, although I see we've gone from 22 participants to eight, so I guess nobody cared. But um, in the world of RNA interference and large animals, in order for it to work for us, we would have had to have amazing transport systems that would be really, really efficient at throwing the small RNAs into our circulatory system and then pulling them into the cells that need them. And since in the absence of that, Instead, what we did was we invented protein systems so the proteins could be released and signaled to the outside of the cell. And so what I would love to see is a modeling of 
virus burst size and virus spread as it relates to some of those pro-inflammatory cytokines and their ability to protect distal tissues as it relates to a comparable system, say, in an insect that's using RNAi, because my guess would be that we were forced to invent the protein-based system that would work on secretion as we got larger and larger from the animal lineage, and that's how we ended up here. But I think you're saying only... transport versus dis diffusion. It, 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 is, is that what you're saying? Well, there's no way we would have been able to invent an entire microfluidic system once we we're down the animal path, right? So that was never going to happen. So the only thing we really could have done was as we got bigger from the animal branch, we could have had more and more sophisticated systems for transporting those small RNAs so that we could achieve something like plasma desmata in trees, but not plasma desmata, something like the channels we see in Drosophila, for example. And I think we could have done that. Um, except for the fact that there was probably then a size limitation where once you passed a certain size, the virus could outpace your RNA transport and then you're cut off. And so until we evolved interferon, you were never going to go past a certain lineage. And that lineage seems to be where mollusks land. So if you look at starfish and like ac uh, acorn worms and things like that, they have hundreds of whole like receptors, but no interferon, no RNAi and no interferon. So they are in this middle hybrid system and they're all kind of comparable in size and comparable in architecture. So I think there's something really there, but it's a really, really hard thing to ever um, generate supporting data for. But all great questions, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I did, I did a couple postdocs on, on evolution. So, um, so I'm, I'm interested in modeling, but maybe uh, modeling that maybe, but uh, maybe not everybody else's. So uh, maybe someone else's questions can go next. So I'll, 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 I'll reach out to you separately. Yeah, please do. Actually, I even have like a microfluidic design to how one could study it and how to do it, but we just never did it. Joy, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, just quickly. Um, I don't know how, how good a model are hamsters for aging. Have you gone there yet? And what are your thoughts about oh, great the question. prophylactic use of NF-kappa B inhibitors? Uh, both good questions. So, um, Aging uh, definitely works, so disease gets more severe with the aging of hamsters. Um, these particular hamsters, we have never, nor have I ever seen anybody been able to induce SARS-CoV-2 mediated death. It is the one thing that we can't phenocopy, but that probably has to do with the fact that we also, like the oldest hamster you can buy is three months. And so we've taken them all the way up to a year. And in a year, they get really sick, but they also like look terrible in general. They lose a lot of their hair. They're really fat, um, which matters because they have to go from being co-caged to single-caged. And we only have 40 cages in our BSL-3, so that really drops our numbers and experiments that we can do. So the field is limited, but we do have a – there's a paper coming out shortly on old hamsters, and basically we find that um, as a result of an upregulation of um, IL-17, you get like – T follicular helper cells in older animals and they perform uh, more poorly. Um, and if you use hamsters from pet stores, which also have you know, all kinds of other things going on, those die 100% of the time when you get them with COVID. So it does seem like all you really need to do is stress them out a little bit further and then you can actually also achieve death. Um, so there's that. Um, and then your second question was, sorry, what was your second question? Uh, just thoughts on, is my part of my interest is aging. And you know they're the ones who die. And thoughts about prophylactic use of NF-kappa oh, NF B. Ah, yes. So actually, we did try. Um, so NF-kappa B is a is a very hard drug to target. So the drug there are there are no good drugs for it. Um, and basically, <laughs> blocking NF-kappa B also causes all kinds of other problems in that you need NF-kappa B for a lot of uh, you know essential aspects of your life. Uh, and so we did try it in hamsters to see if you could find like a sweet balance between the two but we found it to be super toxic and essentially non-effective. So I definitely would not do that. Um, you know, I think the, the direct antivirals are really the only way to go. Uh, we also found that if you, you know, administer interferon, that certainly can help um, lower viral load. But um, yeah, no, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go after it. I be it's a lousy target. But thanks, it's a good question. Cool. Other questions? I don't think I don't think people weren't interested. It's just when we announce a single speaker, usually people assume that oh, we okay. have four, four p.m. gatekeeping, and then and then they 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 schedule other things. And, and yeah, so yeah, no, no, that's fine. That's that was fine. fascinating. That was a fire hose of information. Boy, I would love to talk to you about doing some sort of conceptual modeling of your of your ideas. 
I mean, Lander, well, and, Lo- Lander and Lohengrub have, have both thought a lot about the role of immune cells and fundamentally acting as, as uh, distance amplifiers for signaling, not, not, not in the context of infectious disease, but for example, the context of uh, tissue reconstruction. Uh, and one problem always with tissue reconstruction is that in, in embryos, the scales are short, so you could use diffusion likes of uh, morphogens to control structure. When you're an adult, uh, the diffusion likes are still 50 microns, and so how do you rebuild a tissue that's a, a centimeter across? Yeah, I think you're spot on there, and that would apply to this this as well, right? And so they, their their theory has been that 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 basically immune cells, which can move much further are carrying information that in the embryo would be carried molecularly. Now, in your case, it's a little bit backwards uh, in the sense that you're comparing the, the, the transport length of, of your small interfering RNAs to the transport length then of a circulating uh, cytokine or, or interferon. Uh, but, but I think that some of the issues could be very similar. Yes, I, I would agree with that entirely. That even beyond that, you know, the truth is, is that the circulating cells in us, I, I think you're right, are there. In fact, there's lots of examples, right? Even even the ability to go to the lymph node and present antigen is is another example of you know, you know, basically creating a uh, an offsite CRO to do some of your business offline while you deal with the lung, um, which would make a lot of sense. Uh, as would circulating cells, ensuring that all of your organs, other organs have a level of priming to prevent viremia in case it should happen. And so I should mention one of the things that we found really surprising, and you know, one of the things that right now is a disservice in the scientific literature is that there are so many reports out that only use SARS-CoV-2 and have no benchmark. And so whenever they find, they accredit it with SARS-CoV-2, which is a real problem because there's so much research going on right now that we are hitting depths that we've never hit before, but I was really surprised that by benchmarking it to by benchmarking it to flu, flu also induces systemic interferon priming in every single organ. I just don't think anybody's ever bothered. But why would you look at the kidney following flu infection? It's just not something you would normally do. Um, and so, you know, this this most recent study, which actually hasn't even published yet, um, was really interesting in the sense that. I think to your point that I think there is a, a very large role for uh, circulating cells to communicate with the entire body what's going on everywhere. And I'd be really curious to know if like how refined that communication is. It could very well be that the communication itself is dictating the response, where the, where the response is headed, what kind of organ it is, mucosal versus non-mucosal. Like that, I can certainly see that kind of stuff uh, being in existence. Other question. I, I have one more, and I think you probably said it, and then I was running the meeting, so I missed it, which was you show these very long-term inflammatory responses in the brain. And you mentioned that that could, at least there's some effect of, of essentially continued damage being pro-inflammatory. But there are other diseases that cause you know, tissue damage where you don't get runaway necrosis or apoptosis. So, so do you have any idea about what's special about the self-sustaining post-viremia inflammation uh, that that would be uh, contributing here? So, I, so while, while it's true that flu, for example, does induce systemic inflammation that we see with SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-2 is probably an order of magnitude higher across the board. And so that's why I started the talk with this idea of double-trended RNA production, because while I, I can't say with absolute certainty, my hypothesis to that answer that question would be, it is the nature of virus biology that it produces so much inflammatory material that the amount of inflammation is so high and so sustained for such a long time that it causes this phenotype. Um, but it could be something unique about it. Like there is true, like if you look for for example, if you look at all of these brain regions uh, and compare just SARS to flu, for example, one of the really distinguishing factors between those two models, for reasons I don't even know, is that SARS-CoV-2, for some reason, is a lot of interferon gamma that we do not see in response to flu. 
And so interferon gamma is an interesting one because it's usually not one in my wheelhouse because interferon gamma is more of like a immune cell communicator between, you know, helper T cells and, you know, professional APCs, for example. But the fact that it's such a unique defining factor in the neuronal infection between SARS and flu might also point to the fact that there's something unique about what gets recruited. So like the chemokines that are being induced by SARS are also quite different. So there could be other things that are contributing for sure. It's a great question. I, I guess I still am, I'm still confused. So, so is your belief that there actually are viral components that have persisted over this period of weeks or months? Or no. is, the, is the inflammation is purely self-sustaining? The virus is cleared and the inflammation is purely self-sustaining at this point. And I don't mean just the virus, functional virus, but, but all the viral components are cleared and we now have the self-sustaining uh, uh, pro-inflammatory uh, feedback. So that's a good question. Um, I don't, I don't, so I don't, I don't believe in that. So interferon does not beget more interferon. That's so why, that's why, I mean, that's there's why no, yeah, there's, yeah. Right, So there's no feed forward loop. So we know that. Um, we also know that when we check these tissues with like, you know, TACMAN PCR on DNA treated, plus no RT control because interferon beta has got no intron. And when we do the most sensitive techniques, we also see that very, very few cells or tissues are even producing interferon which you need PAMP, right? You need that RNA to induce interferon. So it's easy for us to distinguish where interferon is being produced and where you're just responding to interferon. And it seems like under normal circumstances, interferon production is happening in the site of infection and amongst those antigen presenting cells and everybody else is just responding to it. Um, with regards to long COVID though, the way it was explained to me by somebody and it seems relatively believable, but again, a little out of my side of my wheelhouse is that because it produces so much double-stranded RNA, um, one double-stranded RNA, the way it's being made is very stable. It's actually a very long, very complementary piece of double-stranded RNA. And then two, because this virus makes so much nucleoprotein, that nucleoprotein will also protect a lot of that RNA from being degraded. So it does make a lot of debris and that debris will have material protecting it to keep it around. Maybe that explains the two weeks of inflammation. And then the way it was explained to me was that the vast majority of your somatic cells, if you stimulate them with anything long enough, they will eventually stop responding to it. There's enough auto feedback that they'll shut it all down. But that cells in the, in the brain are quite a bit different. So neuronal cells, because they have to learn from actions, that continued actions and continuing signaling on neurons can actually cause epigenetic changes that permanently will... Um, modify their signaling and their firing, which is how we learn and remember and have all of these, you know, mental processes. And so I'm not sure if I'm 100% sold on this idea, but the, again, the hypothesis would be two weeks of inflammation everywhere. The big difference is that your somatic cells all reset, your brain does not always. It can, but it doesn't necessarily. So we should brain, blame our microglia, basically. Yeah, your microglia are a problem. So actually, we right now, we have this, there's this drug that kills specifically microglia in the brain. And when we give our hamsters this drug, we can actually prevent all that inflammation in the brain. That, that, that might have other... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would, guess, wouldn't, wouldn't do it, but uh, for, for a small animal model and you're trying to figure out the biology, it's great. But, but it's interesting that the microglia show up in so many situations these days as it's critical. True. They're angry cells. I was just having, of course, conversation this morning with somebody who was working in microglia in a totally different context and microglial dysfunction. So you basically think that the, the negative feedback for, for the inflammatory response that is present elsewhere is in, in some way missing in the brain. So you get this persistence. Right. And I, and I think it's a natural property of neuronal cells um, to, to do that. And in fact, you know, I think, so there's been a lot of reports with people who have long COVID and then got vaccinated or boosted and the long COVID symptoms went away. And some people use that to, to support this idea that there are low levels of virus replication reservoirs in the brain somewhere. Really, really against that idea for, for a variety of reasons, experimental and um, just theoretical. Um, however, what that does do is the mRNA vaccines actually induce a massive interferon response because so much of that RNA does not get into cells. So it gets sensed by you know, various toll-like receptor uh, molecules. Um, this actually came out of um, Bali Palandra's lab, showing that people who get Pfizer or Moderna, 
their PBMCs have massive interference on signatures right after the vaccine. And so even in this, I can see that maybe the reason why people with long COVID might benefit from getting the vaccine is that I would guess that if you then came in again with another bolus of stimulation, you again kind of have another opportunity to reboot or hot start all of your processes um, in the same way actually that people are trying to treat um, anosmia now is that they do it with heavy steroids or jack stat inhibitors in order to try and reset your olfactory neurons because they're not dead. They had just taken on this transcriptional program that is now erroneous from what it should be because when it reset, it didn't properly, you know, engage all of the receptors that was supposed to be making, but it continues to make things like interfere on gamma for no reason. That's, that's, that's fascinating. We had another speaker on anosmia a few weeks ago, so I was making some notes about that because... Uh, Did they use Cocoa Krispies? Coffee. Coffee. But people are hamsters. Well, Gotta she's, say, she's, I loved the Cocoa Krispies paper. That was <laughs> amazing. And yeah. <laughs> it was fun. I think my favorite day was we bought five zeros. We had a guess, see which one they liked the best. So it was like Cocoa Puffs, Captain Crunch, uh, Cheerios, I forget what the other one was, but yeah, they like Cocoa Krispies the best. It's Lucky surprising Charm? the things that they won't like that they should. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't, we didn't try Lucky Charms, we should have. That would have been a good one. The parosmias rather than anosmias. Right. So so that's that's fascinating. I mean, it's too bad that Gary Ann wasn't on the call today because his his great interest is modeling uh, inflammation and, and the, the shutdown of inflammatory response. Well, if you ever uh, want me back or... Uh... We definitely will if you're willing to. Gary's a surgeon, so some days he can't be here. Oh, yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't mean to take any offense to, other than uh, to drop off, but it's fine. No, no, <laughs> it's, just, it's just because, with, with, again, with a single, with a single speaker that, the, that they used oh, yeah, to yeah, yeah. do before p.m. Uh, no but but uh, there was so much to digest that was really, really exceptional. I would love to sometime talk to you. I, mean, I know you're extremely busy, but it would be lovely to talk to you more about the sort of more theoretical question about these race conditions of various kinds. Yeah, I'd love to. And uh, yeah, I, I've uh, I've only interacted with a few mathematical modelers, and I know that you guys really like really detailed and a lot of time points. Um, but I'm sure if, you're, if there's interest there, we can get somebody here to do the data sets you guys want or need to get some of those early uh, models out. But I, I, I do think there's some really good synergy that could happen here. I mean, I think you could go in a variety of ways. And Richard, I didn't mean to cut you off. What, I mean, the thing you talk about, which is your 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 evolutionary question and size scaling question, that could be done in principle with very, very simplified models where you have a protective signal that is transmitted through, for example, diffusion, so it becomes less effective over distance. Uh, and a viral signal that is propagated by diffusion or something else uh, and you can play then with the diffusion constants and the length scales. And of course, as you point out, if something's diffusing and something else is actively transported, the active transporter wins on long distances. Uh, and, and we and others have done, uh, most of it and, and, and other, and we have published and others have published papers trying to just sort of simulate very simple plaque assays where you have interferon induced induction and then the interferon spreads, the virus spreads, and whoever f spreads faster wins. And if the, if the interferon gets ahead of the virus, then you get a, a, a contained lesion. And it, otherwise, the virus wins and you get a, a lesion. I, I have seen this paper. I, I, I didn't, actually didn't realize that it probably came from you and your group. But um, I, I know this paper well, actually. It's a really good one. Yeah. So actually, if you can do that, we, we should definitely talk because um, we actually have this paper that I want to put together, but we made a mouse. Is maybe too much for now right now but we basically made a mouse that expresses uh, an rna dependent rna polymerase because the only way that we could use rnai as mammals would be to have an amplifier of those small rnas so that you could so you don't dilute them uh, and when you do that you get um, chronic interferon across the whole body um so poor mouse but um long story short is it basically says that the two systems are mutually exclusive which means that once you invented interferon you had to erase rnai um, and we have all kinds of evidence to show that RNAi could theoretically work in mammals through a variety of ways. 
And so if we could show by mathematical modeling that size and distribution could be defining factors for that, could actually, we could put a really nice paper together that kind of mixes both of these arguments together in, in greater support. So I would be very interested to talk about that more. Well, if you have an hour next week, I'll be in New York. So. Oh, awesome. Well, I'm in Costa Rica with my little girls next week, but- uh, Oh, I'm sorry, is your- I, I can, You can come to New York thereafter. It's our, uh, it's our winter, or what's it called? It's spring break. Spring break. Yeah. That's why I'm in New York next week. Oh, oh yeah, no, I'm going to Costa Rica. Oh, wonderful. Well, I hope you have a great time. Uh, any other questions before we- uh, we... Just one other question, which maybe you have looked at. Um, so uh, you were talking about various things that could reset. So one thing that has been studied is fasting induces autophagy, which resets a lot of things. So is that something that you've tried in your small animal model? Oh, no, that's actually a really interesting take on it, though. I wonder if anyone ever recommends fasting for a nausea or long COVID. That's a really interesting idea. No, I've never, I've never heard of thought of it or heard of it until just now. But that's a very interesting. I'll write that to some of these people who are writing me who are desperately trying to figure out how to get rid of the uh, smell of ammonia in their nose. Um, but that's actually a really interesting idea. Although I guess for long COVID, it probably wouldn't work because the brain would be the very last thing where you would see that. Um, but maybe for your sense of smell, it would. I don't know. I mean, that's also your brain. So but it's a very interesting idea for sure. I mean, the thing is, you're talking about Richera and, 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 and Benjamin, that, that we worked a little bit experimentally in modeling in a totally unrelated system at some level, which was toxicity in the liver. And there were a couple of things that were striking about it, one of which was that with the toxicant, there was an incredibly sharp threshold between survival and death. I mean, survival and death. You, you changed the, 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 the toxicant dose by 30%. You went from no animals died to 100% of the animals died. Oh, wow. The other thing was you got uh, tremendous uh, immune cell infiltration quickly. In this case, the damage is done in the actual to in the pr prim uh, primary toxicity is happening in four hours. The immune cell infiltration is happening in 12 hours. Everything is over by 48 hours. So it's a different time scale. But what was interesting was the, the fractional number of cells that died, the number of immune cells invading, that were visible at 12 hours between the, all animals will survive and all animals will die was 10%. Wow. And so there seemed to be, and we never did finish that study, so we never really mapped what the cause of this tremendous feedback difference was. But there seemed, at least to the liver, to be this incredibly sharp threshold between uh, uh, clearance and then recovery, because liver is very good at, at recovery, uh, versus uh, runaway uh, necrosis, the death. the death of the whole of the wow. whole. Wow! I mean, and, and it was really a sort of a ten percent level, and you don't usually see that kind of super sharp uh, threshold. Lorenzo, was there a question? Mm, not really. Okay, Besides, I thought I'd your hand up. So. Just no. Uh, did, did I have my end up? No. Well, the comment. My comment is that uh, it's really amazing your work. You have done uh, really a lot of uh, Thanks, complex correlation by experiment, all linked to experimental data, and also a, a lot of the kind of data histological correlation that I like a lot. And so. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. The other had made many questions. So. Lovely. Yeah, it's a good group. I uh, I'm happy with my my group here.